at the uh, dawn of time, early in creation, God, uh, God said this in Genesis 2 and 18. It's not good for man to be alone. <clears throat> I'll make a helper suitable for him. Uh, and that's, a, you know, a God just, uh, um, that was just after Adam had been, you know, naming the animals, so to speak. And the animals were there, and they had, they had, they had male and female, and, and here's Adam all on his own, and God must have felt sorry for him. So God said, uh, I'll make a helper suitable for him. And God answered Adam's aloneness, or loneliness maybe even, by giving him a wife. And from then on, he designed marriage, uh, the coming together of the man and the woman to be the, to be really the, the cornerstone of uh, of all human society. And since it was God's idea in the first place, it uh, it makes sense for us to uh, consult Him or His Word for directions about how to uh, how to make it successful. So this is part two of. Uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7. I'm just going to read them again. We've looked at most of them, but we didn't really look at the last verse, verse 7, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So just reading in 1 Peter chapter 3. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see your purity and the reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewellery and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs uh, with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Amen. <coughs> now what do we say to all that? What, what can we say? Um, last week we learned, uh, for last time, uh, learned that God calls Christian wives, indeed Christian women, to, to, to focus on developing an inner beauty in their character. Uh, and then Peter gives this advice in verse 7 to Christian husbands, uh, and you can apply it even just to men in general, but to husbands in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, treat them with respect, <coughs> with your partner, and heirs with you the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So, I'm going to look at this uh, as much as I'm able to tonight by, by, by breaking it down um, into the, the words even and, and the phrases that are in this verse. So, first thing that Peter says here is one word. Husbands. Husbands. If I was to ask you, uh, uh, what's the key to a Christian marriage? What's the key to a Christian marriage? Uh, think about that for a second. What is the key to a successful, stable Christian marriage? Is it love? Paul talks about love. The greatest of these is love. Or is it is a communication and able to talk with each other back and forth or is it spiritual togetherness you know man and woman husband and wife uh, being together and, and spiritual things what do you think well those things that have, that have mentioned you know love communication spiritual uh, bond with each other this, those things certainly uh, go into making a solid marriage but the Bible says that the key to a solid biblical Christian marriage is the husband the husband now you can take what I'm going to say for yourselves or you can take it maybe to <coughs> share with others uh, who, who knows but 
Um, I want to go into this a little bit, you know, uh, and, and, and really what I think Peter is trying to say <clears throat> when he starts off by saying husbands and then goes on to say a few things is that as goes the man, so goes the marriage. Now that's not 100% true, of course, um, because things can come against a, a man and a woman. Um, but generally speaking, the, the biblical, the biblical um, uh, record is that, that a solid biblical Christian marriage, a lot depends on how the husband is and on how he conducts himself. And if the husband is living out his responsibilities according to the biblical principles of what he's supposed to be as a man, as a, as a husband, marriage will usually not only survive, but it will thrive and it will, uh, it will mature, at least it should. And you've probably, you've probably heard the saying that behind every great man, there stands a great, great woman. woman. Right, a great woman, that's right. And that's certainly true in, 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 in some respects. But according to scripture, behind every good wife, there stands, or there should stand, a godly man, a godly husband. So the secret to a successful, <clears throat> till death us do part, <clears throat> marriage is a Christ-centered <clears throat> husband. <clears throat> but we know we live in a sinful world and, and, and things happen. And, and no matter how much a man may try or a woman may try, uh, sometimes things come against the marriage and they end up separation or divorce or whatever. But uh, he starts off by addressing husbands. And in many, in many cultures today, uh, it's difficult for men to show their emotions and, and to get deeply involved in, 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 in religious pursuits. In fact, uh, there are some people who would say today that one of the problems with the church at large today is that it's become very feminine. Uh, what do you think that means? That the church has become very feminine? More women. Hmm? More women. More women in it, maybe. Or yeah. maybe more women taking leadership parts, or maybe men just not being like men, being more like women. <laughs> yeah. No bike, no bike, no bike. Yeah, could be, could be, yeah. Could maybe. be, yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably a part of it. Um, <clears throat> some would say that, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, upsurge, or that's not the right word, but the, the prominence of uh, a lot of. A lot of songs, Christian songs these days, are very, very lovey-dovey, sentimental, and don't appeal to men. Women can sing them, but men find it hard to sing, Lord, I love you, you know, and all that, that sort of stuff. That, and, and the church has become more feminine, and, and men take a, a, they stand back from all that. They don't, you know, I've had occasion <laughs> at times to look down at a congregation when they're singing, and, and women will sing their hearts out, but men sometimes aren't. They're not getting involved, uh, and, 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 and so on. Men sometimes think that some aspects of church life is childish or sissyish, and um, you know, they don't feel like <coughs> they have to read the Bible or pray or, <coughs> or even cry or shed a tear over, over spiritual things, you know. Uh, and yet, the failure of men to take up their proper roles and responsibilities in marriages and families, um, even in the church, is the single greatest cause for the breakdown of, of marriages and of churches. Um, in fact, many cultures these days uh, and, and, and many places are experiencing the reversal of the male and the female roles. Um, the wife and the husband roles, where the wife becomes the leader and often the emotional, physical provider in the marriage. Uh, and, and the result of all that is that the Christian church, uh, in the Christian church, there's, there's, there's many weak marriages and far too many divorces. And, and men seem to have some, somehow lost the plot. And you know as well as I do, there's a lot of men that don't take Christian or not, don't take their responsibilities as a father. Even there's a lot of, a lot of fatherless children running around. Mm -hmm. The fathers, you know, they create the child, uh, and maybe are there for a while, but then they disappear and they don't accept responsibility. And and then those children, especially those boys, maybe grow up without a father, and 
uh, and so on. So, so there's a big emphasis, there's a big responsibility on men uh, from God's perspective, especially Christian men and especially husbands. And the Bible is clear that the husband is a God-ordained leader in a marriage and in the home. Now, I don't want to get into this, and it's just a passing thought that's come to me, but back, back at the dawn of time again, God created Adam. I said, it's not good to be alone, Adam, so, so here's, here's a helper for you. And uh, uh, the story goes that God said to Adam, Adam, I'm going to give you the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. This woman is going to do everything for you. She's going to wash, she's going to cook, she's going to clean. She's going to do everything, anything you ask, she'll do it. Uh, she's, 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 you know, just going to be the, all you need. And Adam said, well, what's that going to cost me? And God said, well, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. <coughs> and Adam thought, well, what, what would a room get me? And the, the rest is history. <laughs> That's not what I was going to say. That just came to me as well. Um, but, um, uh, what was I going to say? Yes, when, when Adam and Eve then came together, and you know the story, uh, Eve was tempted and, and gave in to the temptation, and, and then Adam as well, and here we are. Uh, the legacy of all that was sin, but when that happened, when Eve was tempted and, and the first was the first one to commit sin, who did God approach to inquire about it? Adam. Adam, because Adam should have been the spiritual, the spiritual head of mm -hmm. the family in that, that respect, such as it was back, back then. Um, God holds uh, men, husbands, responsible for the spiritual, physical, economic, emotional activities of the marriage and of the home. <coughs> and, and, and he's to give, <coughs> a husband is to give a, a loving, leadership and directions uh, you know appropriate directions and counsel to his wife and children now, now some commentators are would be of the opinion that that this verse is speaking to christian husbands with unsaved wives um, just as in the reverse we looked at last time uh, in the first six verses where the duties of saved wives to their husbands unsaved husbands were presented to us, but but it would seem to me that Peter's obviously addressing Christian husbands who are married to Christian wives. Because this verse says that the husband is to recognise his wife as a fellow heir of the grace of life. See that in the verse. So that could only be a reference to a saved wife and a saved husband. And the reason Peter did not address the issue of relationship of a saved husband to an unsaved wife uh, was that that would have been a rare thing back in those days in the first century when he was writing uh, usually if a man became a Christian the wife and the family soon followed and, and this was a, a man-centered culture back then <coughs> some people would say it still is but uh, we've come a long way from, from, from there and you may, you may have noticed that in this passage that I read, six times as much information is given to wives than to husbands. First six verses are to wives. Only one verse, the seventh, is to husbands. And some might interpret that to mean that wives are six times more in need of, uh, of shaping up in a marriage than a man. But that's, that, that's not what it's saying. Um, you could as easily interpret it to mean that it's six times more difficult for wives to live with, with, with their husbands sometimes than for husbands to live with their wives. But anyway, he starts off, he says, husbands. And then he says, what's the next phrase? In the same way, or likewise, is another translation. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he used that phrase back in the first verse. Wives in the same way. And now we have husbands in the same way. And, and uh, this, this is a reference uh, uh, back to the example of Christ who suffered innocently and unjustly 
but they're uttering a word. He was like a silent before his accusers and all the rest of us. The likewise are in the same way. It seems to suggest some kind of submission as well on the part of the man, uh, on the part of men, uh, not to their wives, but to God. Not to their wives, but to God. Christian husbands, <clears throat> Christian men, are to submit to God in their marriages and their relationships and, and take you know, their, their proper responsibilities. Not giving in to their wives as such, but giving up of themselves to their wives. And what he seems to be saying here is when husbands are in submission to God, they'll be serving their wives and, and taking proper responsibility in, in, in the relationship. Uh, and so what he's saying here really about the, the role and responsibilities and the function of a Christian husband, a Christian man, uh, seems to be based on another divine revelation about Christian husbands that's found in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Because you know in Ephesians 5 and 23 Paul says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the saviour of the body. And, and that clearly teaches that the headship in a marriage is the responsibility of the man, of the husband. Uh, it's a headship of love, whereby uh, he's to be a good leader as Christ has headship over the church and leads the church. And as the church looks to Christ for, for, for motivation, for direction, for, for leadership, as we ought in the church, so the wife is to look to her husband for the same thing. Um, so Christian husbands really should set the pattern for all, all spiritual activities in the home because just as Christ was, Christ was a prophet, priest and king. And so was the husband in terms of the spiritual uh, aspect of the home. And uh, I think it's long since gone when there used to be um, uh, an altar in the home, you know, uh, a prayer altar where the family would come together and they would pray, they would sit around together, they would read scripture, they would pray. I don't know if that's, if that's around anymore, uh, even in Christian homes, because husband's busy with work and out and about and the wife maybe is busy with her own work and out and about and then the children have all sorts of activities that they're involved in after school and in the evenings and, and families hardly sit down together anymore um, and yet that's uh, that's that, that's really what what it should be um, so the man is the, the husband is supposed to be the leader the head of the house the home but he has absolutely no right as that to govern his home in the wrong way. And uh, he who has headship must also have hardship, if I can put it like that. The husband, uh, the man is to lead by love and not by force. Um, <clears throat> and, and Christian husbands are not to be harsh or, or selfish, but they are to, to love their wife, to love their family. And express that in whatever way uh, they can. In fact, the Bible says five times uh, in Ephesians 5, verse 25, verse 28, verse 33, Colossians 3, verse 19, five times that a man is to love his wife. The husband uh, is to rule with love. Uh, he's never to abuse his headship or his authority. And yet that seems to be happening more and more, even in Christian homes, for whatever reason. I, uh, I volunteer with an organisation called uh, uh, Victim Support Northern Ireland. Uh, it's an organisation set up to help the victims of crime because as you probably know or would expect when a crime happens, the police get involved, they detect who it was, committed the crime, whatever it was, and they, they, they arrest, they process, they prosecute, <coughs> take them to court and all the rest of it. But the victim gets forgotten in it all, gets left behind in it all. And uh, uh, so this organisation has been set up uh, many, many years ago to look after the, the victims of crime and to inquire just how they're doing, if they, if they, if they want, want someone to talk to. And so once a week as a volunteer, I'm given a couple of referrals, names <coughs> and, and phone numbers and all the rest of it, who, who've said 
uh, to the organization, yes, we would like someone to talk to about this. Um, and I, I call them, it used to be face to face before the pandemic. And I used to go to an office in Lurgan um, and we would meet face to face and we would, it's a listening thing more than anything else, an encouraging thing. But I have to do it over the phone, so I was doing that today for a couple of hours. Um, and, and it seems, uh, and, and victim support Northern Ireland would, would, would say that there's more and more domestic violence incidents than ever before. Now, well, that's got something to do with the two years of lockdown and pandemic and all the rest of it, but there's a, an awful upsurge. And it's even sadder when, 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 when there's domestic disturbance in a Christian home and then a Christian family, and yet we know that that, that, that happens. So the husband is not to be a dictator. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the woman is to love her husband. The husband is commanded to love his wife. And uh, that's not an option. It's a command. Uh, and God has ordained that the man should be both a leader and a lover in the home and in the marriage. Uh, and if a husband is trying to be a leader without being a lover to his wife and his family, then he'll end up being a just a dictator um, and if he's a lover and uh, without being a leader and he lets anything go then he's just a wishy-washy sort of a man uh, so he has to be both a leader and a lover and so where have we got to Peter says husbands in the same way uh, be considerate as you live with your wives uh, and treat them uh, with respect. Um, he's talking about living together in an understanding way. Uh, husbands are, are commanded to live or to dwell uh, with their wives uh, in an understanding way, which means according to knowledge, to the knowledge of Scripture. Be aware of what's required of you as a, as a godly man in a relationship, in a marriage, uh, as a husband, as a father, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, be considerate as you live with your wives. Um, another translation says, live with your wives in an understanding way. Um, and uh, that means in, in every aspect of living. In every aspect of living. Um, the word translated live with has the, the literal translation of to share the same bed. And Peter's advice starts in the bedroom, if you like, and goes out from there to every other room in the house and everything else in between. Um, and, and the King James calls the husband to live with his wife according to knowledge. According to knowledge. In other words, know your wife. Uh, know this woman that you have committed your life to. Study her. Get to know her. What makes her tick? Figure out how her mind works. Learn what her gifts are. Uh, what her desires, her hopes, her dreams. And that's a lifelong thing as well. Uh, in Proverbs 31, of course, you find God's picture of a virtuous woman. Uh, you might know that passage well. Yes, it says there she's a homemaker, a wife, a mother, but it says that she also considers a field and buys it and from her earnings plants a vineyard. And uh, then verse 11 in Proverbs 31 says, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing in value. The heart of her husband trusts her and he will have no lack of grain. And so uh, I think for some men, they, they fear their wife uh, being allowed to, to, to develop her abilities and her gifts and, and, and so on. But they think, of, well, she'll get too big for her feet and she'll leave me or something. And they try to keep her, keep her pinned, pinned down. Um, but uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, so you're supposed to you know, encourage them to develop their God-given gifts. Um, the smartest thing any husband can do is to turn his wife loose and encourage her to be all that God wants her to be <coughs> and not, not hold her back from that. And so Peter, Peter's basically saying, husbands, it's your job to study your wife, to know her intimately, to live together with her on the basis of knowledge. Now in the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 4, and verse 3, where the lover says to his beloved, your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. And if you open up a pomegranate, you'll find it has many sections inside, little sections, big sections. And 
I want to say in a courteous and in a gentle <clears throat> way, that's what a woman's mind is like. Complex with many sections, big and small. And in fact, modern science backs up Solomon's great wisdom and insight into this because we know that the brain contains two hemispheres, the left and the right. And the neuroscientists tell us that women typically have a larger pathway between the two hemispheres so that information can flow freely back and forth. And to put it in a simple way, most men have a bit of a footpath between them, but the women have a highway <laughs> between them, a super highway. They're generally more verbal, more able to multitask uh, as well, more in touch with their emotions, better at forming, you know, relationships. Uh, and in contrast, we men, well, we're better at non-verbal tasks. We just get on with it. Uh, and uh, that's probably why, you know, House with a TV, man likes to have the remote control uh, as well. Um, someone said, women are amazing if not a mystery. And I suppose that's true because you can be married for 30 or 40 or 50 years and still find your wife fascinating because her mind works in so many ways. Uh, and, and, and so um, it's good to encourage them to develop their gifts, their God-given gifts. Uh, and it's a real blessing to see a Christian wife blossom under the, the creative encouragement of, of, of her husband. Um, and we should note as well, when we're, we're talking about this, that the measure of a man's manhood is not in how much alcohol he can put away. Some men think that's, that's it. Or how much money he makes. Or how many affairs he's had with how many women. Or how high he's gone up in the corporate ladder. But it's how much he knows and applies the word of God to his own life. And I think it's fair to say, I'll not ask any of you men here to, uh, to address this, but most men uh, can question their manhood at one time or another. It often comes after the age of 40, you know, middle age uh, crisis and all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, a teenage boy and a man in midlife crisis are both struggling with their, uh, with their manhood identity. One's trying to enter manhood as a teenager, the other's <coughs> trying to keep from losing it. Uh, but the measure of a man is the degree to which he knows and obeys the word of God for his own life, and especially if he's in a relationship, in a marriage, or whatever. But then Peter goes on. He's got a lot to say to men, really, in one verse, hasn't he? Condense it down pretty well. Um, and he says, you treat them with respect as the weaker vessel, since, uh, uh, and he adds this, I'm not sure if it's in the King James, since she is a woman. Now, that probably, that phrase, the weaker vessel, probably makes most women's eyes roll. I think, what does Peter think he is? Weaker? We're weaker? Um, well, it begs the question, in what sense is he talking here about being a weaker vessel? It's certainly not in the intellect. There's a lot of women that are brainier than I am. Uh, it's not morally or spiritually, but obviously uh, there's a, there is a certain weakness in, 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 in physical capacities, in, 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 in stature. Uh, and, and, and that's why there's a whole, uh, a whole thing these days in sports. You've probably read about it from time to time, about men who have transed into being women wanting to take part in women's sports well there's a physical difference there regardless of what you're thinking in your head about who you are uh, and all the rest of it uh, and so that's that's <coughs> that's one thing um, but it, it should also be noted that there are some physical things that, that women can do better than a man and one of them I, I believe is to endure pain I think women are better at enduring pain than men are, especially when you think about childbirth. Like, I wouldn't want to uh, experience that. You, you women know what that's like. But there may be another sense in which Peter's talking about the woman, the wife, as a weaker vessel. Um, now, she may be emotionally 
mm. weaker. Now that doesn't mean that she's emotionally unstable or all of that. But but women are more sensitive. They are. They're more emotional that way. They're more fragile, and they can be easily broken. Um, and God has made them to be to be warm, loving, feeling creations and therefore they're to be loved they're to be protected they're to be cared for by their husbands uh, and, and men are to have a sensitivity to their wives but then peter adds this unexpected phrase when he says husbands are to do all this since she is a woman since she is a woman that brings us back to genesis 2 18 when god created eve as a helper for adam and the old phrase help meet uh, means one who does for another what that person can't do for themselves and for men that means that our wives are given to us because we're incomplete without them no. uh, you know husbands and wives um, and, and, and the literal <coughs> translation of weaker vessel uh, is similar <coughs> to our word vase or vase right what do you say <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and, and it was originally used, this, this expression, weaker vessel, was used for priceless, fragile ornaments, <clears throat> as well as for the sacred vessels used in the temple for the worship of God. In other words, wives are to be re regarded by their husbands as priceless porcelain or, or, or costly china, right? Fine bone china, belik. China or whatever um, and it's a call to, to gentleness husbands love your wives don't be harsh to them um, Paul writes in Colossians and when Peter calls a wife a weaker vessel he's not referring to their moral character as I said or their intellectual ability or whatever or to their outward beauty it refers primarily to this difference in physical strength uh, of course between men and women uh, and uh, when men take this into account in its proper way well he might actually help out around the house he might do the dishes now and again or, or the washing or the ironing I've done all those things still do a bit of them uh, might empty the bins uh, do the cooking or younger husbands might, might uh, get the kids up in the morning and off to school uh, and so on and so uh, that's all around that whole area of of of, of uh, treating your wife with 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 honor and with respect and he, and he says that grant her honor um notice what he's saying a man is to serve the woman and give her a place of honor and and i i think i wouldn't be wrong to say that we need a a little bit more old-fashioned chivalry chivalry yeah today uh, you know when she getting into the car he holds the door for her nothing wrong with that when they enter a room she goes in first nothing wrong with that uh, when they walk down the footpath they're going for a walk he walks on the outside for protection that's the way it's supposed to be um, husbands in other words are to show courtesy politeness kindness uh, and, and those sort of things, I suspect, give security to their wives uh, when they're treated like that. And, and those are probably things that we men did almost instinctively when we were curtain or courting back in the day, right? Um, but we can easily forget about those things as time, uh, as time goes on and begin to take <coughs> our wives... <coughs> Uh, and our marriage is for granted. A Christian wife doesn't want and would never get a perfect husband. But she does want, I, I suspect, a Christian wife wants a man who will be a loving leader and who will treat her with kindness and courtesy and sensitivity. In other words, a husband who will treat her biblically. I know I'm talking to the converted here, man, right? You, you, you know all this. And then he adds another bit of advice. Treat her with respect. And to honour and, and respect someone means to assign value uh, to that person. And, uh, you know, you know this as well as I do in, 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 in most scenarios. People tend to live up to or down to our expectations of them. 
if we offer repeated praise and an affirmation, the person usually responds by living up to that. But sadly, the opposite is true as well. If we were talking down to people and putting people down, then, then they'll, they'll shrink and, 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 and so on. And honour and respect is a choice that a husband has to make. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Uh, and so we have to treat her with honour and respect. <coughs> and uh, just when I'm talking about that, you know, we men tend to think that uh, our wives, our women, uh, know how we feel. Uh, and so we don't think we have to talk about it or to tell them over and over again. You know, I told you I loved you when I got married. If I ever change, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, they like to, to know uh, that we're still in love and so on. We have to tell them again and again and again to show them uh, the things we do again and again um, and so on. And it's, it's easy for men to say, as some men do, well, I work hard, you know, I provide you with a nice home. Clothes, food, money, what more could you want? Well, your wife married you, married you, not your paycheck. And many wives who are well off in material goods are desperately lonely, uh, waiting for their husbands to really notice them, waiting to be appreciated, waiting to be remembered. And so the husband is, to both, is both to know his wife and to honour and respect her. And then he says this, this kind of strange sort of phrase uh, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life what do you think that means treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs of you with you of the gracious gift of life it's equal no hmm? equal 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 in what way in um, for god uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I said both. Both are headed for heaven as Christians. Mm. They're 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 in their eternal inheritance. They both have that. They're equal on a spiritual level. Uh, now, on the physical level, there may be differences, but on the spiritual level, there's <coughs> no differences. Uh, you know, saved in the same way. Gifted by God, in whatever way God wants to gift a man or a woman, um, and so on. Now, there's limitations to, 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 to that um, equalness that's been pushed, the boundaries been pushed in many places. Um, back started back in the 60s, I suppose, with uh, you know, women's liberation and uh, you know, uh, throw your bra off and, uh, and go free, and, 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 and this whole thing about women wanting to be equal with men in the workplace and, and all the rest of it. And I'm not going to debate that back and forth. Um, but it's even entered the church. And there's been a blurring between responsibilities of men and women in the church. And, and, and men have to accept that. Uh, um, they've allowed that. And, and, and are even today. And, and uh, that's for another another discussion. But in many, in many denominations now, there and there have been, <laughs> um, you know, men and women in the pulpit, and, and women with leadership over men in the church. And uh, as, as I say, a touchy subject in some places, but uh, um, we, we have to go back to how God set up the roles and responsibilities for men and women in the first place, back uh, even as far as the Garden of Eden. And uh, it's caused problems. Um, I used to be... <coughs> In the Salvation Army, um, when I was first saved, a, a Christian evangelical denomination, although it's kind of fallen back in many ways over the years, but the founder of the Salvation Army way back at the turn of the century, the last century, William Booth, um, right from the, the beginning had men and women equal, you know, in, in, in their responsibilities. In fact, he used to say that some of my best men are women. <laughs> and that wouldn't go too well today, but um, uh, but there's an issue there that that uh, has to be has to be regarded, I suppose. Um, but um, you know, women are equal in that sense, like you said, Bernie, and, and and a husband must never think of himself in any way superior 
in spiritual privilege to the woman, except in some roles and responsibilities where God has ordained uh, that. Um, and you know, going back to the feminization of the church, it's true that in, in a lot of in, in a lot of churches, regardless of denomination, the women seem to be the ones that step forward all the time. You know, you think of the different ministries in the church, and women are keen to help and help out, and men kind of hang back, uh, and, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be like that. Um, but we ought to know and honor our wives as fellow heirs of the grace of life. Not because of, not because of what she is, but because of who she is, and uh, just as it takes two people to bring life into the world, a man and a woman. Uh, so there's also a spiritual truth here. In one sense, both man and woman are made in the image of God, <coughs> but in another sense, man and woman together reflect part of God's nature that's not possible to reflect. In just one person and marriage offers the best human illustration of the trinity two persons joined together becoming flesh distinct yet complementing each other and, and husband and wife are fellow heirs equal partners of the grace of life and either one is more important than the other um, and we receive our inheritance of the grace of life day by day yes we're going to receive the full inheritance one day but we receive the grace of God the grace of life day by day and so in that regard a Christian marriage should improve as the years go by <clears throat> and, and, and not you know uh, end up in something that it shouldn't um, and I, I suppose it's worth saying that, that Christianity is unique in the way it, it regards women in its treatment of women uh, un under every other system of religion that you can think of in the world women are regarded uh, as inferior to men but wherever the gospel has been received women are treated uh, uh, not as chattels um, but as joint heirs uh, and only in Christianity are women given their proper place before God and before their husbands and then Peter finishes this off <coughs> as we come to an end he says you do all this in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives treat them with respect with honor uh, the weaker partner and his heirs joint heirs with you and the grace of life gracious gift of life why so that nothing will hinder your prayers peter closes this this little section here about marriage with a, with a very strong and, and seemingly strange warning that should be a motivation for men to take <coughs> this biblical, these biblical truths seriously. The word for hindered here, so that nothing will hinder your prayers, uh, is a military term. Uh, a military term for digging a trench in a road to stop the enemy's advance, hindering the enemy. And it describes what Satan will do in a man's spiritual life if he doesn't take his responsibilities before God to his wife seriously. Satan will dig a <clears throat> trench and your prayers will never get through. A marriage that's out of tune emotionally or physically will soon be out of tune spiritually. And to put it bluntly, no man can deliberately or physically uh, can deliberately or physically um, uh, or persistently I should say ignore his wife, disrespect his wife and expect to get a hearing with God at the same time it just, just doesn't work that way God takes the side actually of the weaker vessel and only when we're truly one with each other can we be truly one with God together and uh, you can apply that principle in a broader way to, to other relationships if, if we harbour bitterness or if we're unkind, if we gossip about people, if we're angry and stay angry, our prayers won't get through to God. You can't say, I, I, I hate you, by, by the things we say and do about a brother or sister in Christ, and then say to God, I love you. It's like oil and water, they don't mix. And God has wired us so that there's a, a direct connection between, between the horizontal 
relationships and the vertical. Mm -hmm. And the way we treat others has a direct impact on how God will respond to our prayers. Mm. And when he says uh, nothing, so that nothing will hinder your prayers, uh, the your may refer to the prayers of the husband, but probably means the prayers of both husbands and wives. And, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a biblical marriage, <coughs> you're trying to, uh, to live up to what God expects as a husband, as a wife, as partners together, you should be partners in prayer. Yes, each of us are responsible to God for ourselves, but in a, in a marriage relationship, which is really a covenant, um, then uh, uh, husbands and wives should seek to pray as much as they can together. Um, and, and if there's children involved, to have a, to be a family time as well, a family altar. Um, <clears throat> but if a husband is not living with his wife uh, as he ought to in, in understanding, treating her with honour as a fellow heir of the grace of life, his prayers as a husband are going to be cut off or interrupted. And, and this verse clearly teaches that a husband and wife's relationship together affects our relationship to God. And so as we try to bring this to a close, this, this little section here, uh, the relationship really between a husband and wife is so fundamental that if it's ignored it'll destroy the relationship with God. Prayer is a lifeline between us and God and if there's quarreling, if there's jealousies, if there's discon disconnection between them, if there's con contention, harsh looks, unkind words, unwillingness to forgive, their prayers will not be answered. And you know what can easily creep into a relationship. You just have to uh, you know, compare it as opposed to the love chapter in First Corinthians chapter 13. And all that Paul says there should be part of how we regard each other, even to the fact, effect of saying, you know, um, uh, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, doesn't bring stuff up again all the time. There's to be forgiveness. But anyway, Peter's saying that if a Christian husband's prayer life isn't right, he may not need to pray more that's not what he's saying. He may only need to get his life straight with his wife. And a man who's insensitive to his wife is going to be insensitive to God in one way or another. Uh, and, and this is a very practical um, passage here, especially this, this last part. Uh, and Christian husbands and wives can't be down on their knees together if they have their hands wrapped around each other's throats. Again, it doesn't work like that. So Peter uses this, and uh, go back to the introduction to wives and to husbands, the same phrase, verse 1, verse 7, in the same way. And that takes us back into chapter 2, where he calls all Christians to follow in the steps of Christ, in the same way, who suffered but never struck back, when he was insulted, when he was attacked, when he was hit when they spat on him, when he was mistreated, <clears throat> he submitted himself to his Father in heaven, trusting him uh, in the hour of his greatest suffering. And so the cross of Jesus is, a, is not just the pattern for marriage, it's also a basis for every Christian relationship. And here's what I believe God is saying through Peter in these seven verses, just to sum them up as we finish. He's saying, wives, be like Jesus. Husbands, be like Jesus. Christians, be like Jesus. And remember, if you want to be like Jesus, there'll always be a cross somewhere along the road, a cross to bear. It will cost you something. But when we're like Jesus, our lives will be filled with inner beauty. Our prayers will be unhindered. God will be glorified. And the world will surely see Jesus at work in our relationship or relationships and uh, here endeth this lesson tonight amen